Most of us don't know that there were 12 presidents that owned slaves. Eight of them while they were in the White House, or the president's house, meaning that this contradiction that emerged at the very beginning of the country brought itself into this magnificent symbol of the country, the White House, or where the president lived. Good morning. I'm Brian Vallow. I'm a professor in the Department of History at UVA, and I run the National Fellowship Program here at the Miller Center. And I'm a co-host on Backstory with the American History Guys, a uh, show on National Public Radio. Uh, I'm delighted to continue the Miller Center's commemoration of Black History Month today uh, by welcoming uh, Professor Clarence Lussain uh, to our midst. Uh, he's never been to the Miller Center Forum before, but we're delighted to have him here today. Professor Hussein is an associate professor at uh, American University in the uh, School of International Service, and he's also the program director of Comparative and Regional Studies there. He's here to talk about his book today, uh, the Black History of the White House, uh, a perfect topic for uh, uh, an issue dear to our hearts here at the Miller Center. And uh, if I listed all of his books and publications, we truly would be here for the rest of the afternoon. So I will simply tell you that he has written extensively about race relations, especially in the global context. It's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Hussein. Good morning. Thank you, Brian, for that great uh, introduction. Uh, it is my pleasure to be here at the Miller Center. I've never uh, had the opportunity, and I've when I was invited, I looked on the website, and I saw just the long list of very eminent uh, individuals who have come and who have made presentations and engaged the audience, so I feel very honored to be able to be part of this uh, long history and this long flow now. I also want to thank, as I always do publicly, City Lights, uh, the publisher of this book. City Lights, for those of you who don't know, has a long and glorious history of publishing authors who probably can't get published in some of the mainstream uh, publishers, uh, some of the most famous poets and fiction writers out of the 1950s and 1960s were published by City Lights, uh, which is based in San Francisco. So to be part of that pantheon is also a big honor on my part. And uh, as those of you who do research and writing know, you can't do this kind of work without support from your family. And so it's always important, I think, also to give public acknowledgement to uh, my wife and my two-year-old uh, who were there uh, as I was writing this book. Sometimes they were there just to give me support and encouragement and bring me a cup of tea. And other times they were there to take me out the room and say, go get some sunshine. <laughs> and you know, there's life going on besides sitting in front of the laptop all day. So it's important to really kind of honor uh, those. Uh, what I'm going to do is uh, talk a little bit about the purpose behind the book, how I ended up writing this book, and then go into a little bit of detail uh, about the period leading up to President Obama. The book actually goes from the beginning of the U.S. all the way up through the Obama administration, uh, but I won't talk that much about that. If there are questions about uh, that at the end of the talk, then, then, uh, then we can deal with it. Uh, what really uh, inspired me was I was asked by the publisher to write something about Obama, but because there are so many books coming out, there are more books on Obama probably than any other president besides Abraham Lincoln, uh, I didn't want to just write another book about Obama's breaking new barriers and all of that. I uh, wanted to find a way to kind of talk about something that perhaps wasn't being covered. And what I realized was that part of what we were going through as a nation, and indeed much of the world, was a reimagination. Because when we thought of US presidents prior to 2008, the image that came to mind was basically older white guys who had become our presidents. And with Obama, it forced us to reimagine what the presidency was. 
But that had to happen within a particular context. And so what I wanted to do was to frame the Obama rise in this long, long, long historic flow. Uh, as Brian mentioned, when much of what I do is international. And so in 2007 and 2008, as I traveled around the world from Brazil to South Africa to the UK to Japan, people wanted to know, could Obama win? What would it mean to have a black person uh, as president? Would he change the name of the White House? <laughs> right? And why was it called the White House? And so I realized that actually I didn't have answers to some of those questions. So that inspired some of the research to go back and start to look at, you know, what actually is this history? Obama is actually not the first black person in the White House. So how do you contextualize? How do you draw this history out? So that was kind of one motivation. And then also to challenge some of the kind of erroneous historic statements that, are, that were being made. Uh, Michelle Bachman, for example, said that the founding fathers did everything they could to end slavery with all the breath that they could bring to it, uh, which is just erroneous. But this is someone who's a representative in Congress. What she says goes out to millions of people. So she does have an impact. So there is a need to, to challenge those kinds of uh, irresponsible and, and ahistoric uh, statements. So those are really kind of two motivators. But as I began to do the research, a third purpose began to emerge, and that was to give voice to those who have been voiceless throughout this history. Because I thought initially this would be a very short book. It would be about 150 pages. I could go back to doing what I was doing. It ended up being about 550 pages because the stories kept emerging, and the book began to basically write itself. And as I began to uncover these really outstanding, remarkable individuals, I continued to expand and research and find out you know, exactly what were in the history, the context of these people. And again, City Lights was very generous. They pretty much said, write until you're tired. And then <laughs> we'll figure out a way to get it published. Most publishers say, you've got 200 pages, that's it. Stick it all in there. You know, it might be in seven point, but you know, get it all in. But they were very generous, and so I, I really appreciate that. Uh, just kind of to, to, to begin with, uh, most of us uh, don't know that there were 12 presidents that owned slaves. Eight of them while they were in the White House, meaning that they're, or in the White House or the president's house, meaning that this contradiction that emerged at the very beginning of the country brought itself into this magnificent symbol of the country, the White House, or where the president lived. And that, you know, in the book, what I try to do is trace that, starting with not the Boston Massacre, which for many people is seen as the beginning of the US Revolution, but with the Somerset decision. The Somerset decision was a case in England where a person who was enslaved from the US was taken to England, he escaped, he was captured, and he, uh, instead of being sent back, there was a trial to determine whether or not he could be uh, free. The case resolved with not only letting Somerset uh, be free, but it ended slavery in England. And this was in 1772. Uh, now, it didn't apply to the colonies, but the fact that it could at some point animated many people in the South to join the revolution. But with the caveat, with the bargaining chip that we will join your revolution, but slavery must be protected. And that became the grand uh, bargain that found itself into the US Constitution. It found itself into those founders, Madison, Jefferson, George Washington, Hamilton, all of those uh, founders who were there at the very beginning of the country, many of whom were very publicly against slavery, but bought in and became part of this bargain. So from the very beginning, that kind of manifests itself. Now, we saw this uh, in the decision to build Washington, D.C., where Washington, D.C. exists. It was this land that's ceded from Virginia and Maryland. And one of the uh, uh, deals coming out of the founding of the country was that we're going to build a brand new city. We're not going to just throw the capital anywhere. We're going to build the grandest city in the world at the time. And it's going to take 10 years to build. 
And so the deal was that in that 10 year period, if the concession was that it could be built in the South, basically in slave territory, then that 10 year period, the temporary capital, the temporary government could be somewhere else. And as it turns out, it was Philadelphia. This 10 year period when this uh, Washington DC was built, was built to a significant degree by slave labor, meaning that the US Capitol, as well as the building we now call the White House, was built by people who were enslaved. There were free whites, there were free blacks who also worked on those uh, buildings, but significantly embedded in the very construction of these symbols of the new democracy in the new country is slave labor. Now in 2010, in the US Congress, a plaque was put up to honor people uh, who were enslaved or to commemorate the people who helped to build the US Capitol. Uh, just yesterday, I received a letter from Congressman Gary Augerman, who, is, who just sent a letter to President Obama about putting a plaque up for those who, who were enslaved in the White House because there's nothing that exists. If any of you go on a tour of the White House, uh, and I would encourage you to do that. Now these are kind of self-guided tours. But if you go on a tour of the White House, there is nothing that's going to tell you as you walk through this building, and I've done it many times, that you're standing over the part where slaves were kept, or you're standing on the part where slaves were beat, or you're standing on other parts of this building itself that was put together by people who were enslaved. But that becomes part of the history of this building. So meanwhile, you've got 10 years of people working to build a building, some doing just hard labor. Washington, D.C., or what the land that was given was basically a jungle. It was trees and rocks, so it had to be cleared out. So it was just straight up hard manual labor. But there was also skilled labor. We know, for example, there were at least five black carpenters who worked on the White House and worked on the Capitol. There were plasterers. There were others who had actually highly skilled labor that helped to build that building. But as those 10 years of building the uh, Washington DC was going on, meanwhile in Philadelphia you had President Washington, who spent a little bit of time in New York, but most of his presidency was in Philadelphia. And he moved there with his household of at least nine slaves to the city that was the center of abolition in the country. And Washington didn't quite get that until he got there. <laughs> And he was getting petitions. People were knocking on his door. There was a lot of activity going on. But also in, Philadelphia, in Pennsylvania, they had also passed a law called the Gradual Abolition Act, which said that if any person enslaved is brought into the state of Pennsylvania and they stay for six months, the first day after that six months, they can apply for manumission, for freedom. And it didn't exclude the president. It excluded members of Congress, but it didn't exclude the president. Washington found this out and went, oh my God, what do I do? <laughs> so he came up with a plan with his staff that they would rotate people in and out of the state because there was a loophole that said if at any point in that six months the person left and they came back, the six month clock would start all over again. And so we have evidence of the letters where, where Washington said, take them out because the time is coming and we don't want them to have this opportunity. Uh, which more or less worked, uh, but there were people who, while they didn't get their freedom legally, they escaped from Washington. One of whom that I discovered in my research is a woman named Oni, Oni Judge. Oni was a young woman, 22, something like that, who mostly was enslaved to Martha Washington, who helped to dress her and, and worked around the house. She found out early in 1796 that Martha Washington was planning to give her away as a wedding gift. And this was extremely disturbing because the Washingtons had always said that when they passed away, the people who were enslaved to them would be given their freedom. If she was going to be sold or given to a, a relative, she would probably never get out of slavery. So she made her decision to escape. And she made contact with the free black community in uh, Pennsylvania, in, in Philadelphia. And as she says, one day, while the Washingtons were sitting at the dinner table, waiting for only to bring out the soup or the food, she went out the back door. <laughs> 
We don't know how long they sat there before they realized <laughs> that Oni was gone. But at some point, they said, oh my god, Oni is gone. Uh, she escaped, got to New Hampshire, and was doing fine. Except one day, she ran into someone on the street who knew the Washingtons. And they were, Oni, what are you doing here? And she was like, uh, see you later, right? But she was kind of busted. They told the Washingtons, guess who I ran into in Portsmouth? So now they knew where she was at. She was at. They decided, OK, we're going to get her. But let's try to talk to her. So Washington sent his nephew to meet with her. Uh, she agreed. They sat down. The nephew said, you know, things got out of control. Things went bad. but." We can work this out, come back, and then one day we will set you, you, we will give you your freedom. Oni was, well, I'm free now, so I don't really see the purpose of <laughs> this plan at all. So thanks, but no thanks. So nephew goes back, tells George, you know, she didn't buy this. So rather than give it up, they decide they're going to kidnap her. So they send the nephew back to organize a kidnapping plan, and at that point, the slave catching industry was a booming industry. It had grown because of the slave fugitive clause in the Constitution, the Slave Fugitive Act that had been passed in 1790. So there was a whole industry that just went after people uh, who had escaped from slavery. In fact, there were people who were captured who had not escaped from slavery uh, who were uh, captured in the North and sent to the South. So the, the nephew goes back. He's going to organize this um, capture. But as it turns out, the family who had originally exposed her accidentally found out about it. They were actually very anti-slavery. They warned Oni, and so she was not captured. She was able to get away, right? Nephew goes back again empty-handed. Washington passes away. Uh, not long after, so she basically lives the rest of her life without, she's a fugitive, but basically she doesn't have to worry about being captured for the most part. She lives to be in her 80s, she learns to read, she becomes active in her community. She does interviews, and they're really interesting because she talks about, she was inspired by the Haitian Revolution, Right, which had happened in the early 1790s. And even though the internet didn't exist at the time, everybody who was enslaved everywhere in the world knew about the Haitian Revolution, as well as everybody who was a slaver. And she talks about that. But she also talks about the American Revolution. And when you think about it, the people who were the closest to Madison and to Jefferson and to all of these founders, as they debated and discussed and discoursed about breaking from this tyranny of England, and creating a country where people were subjects or people were citizens, the people who heard this on a daily basis were people who were the enslaved. People who were standing there serving the tea, people who were sweeping and cleaning up the room, they heard all of this. So she talks about this, and I think there's a lot more research we need to do on the impact of these discussions and discourses on people who were in and around uh, people who uh, founded the country. So Oni was, became like a hero of mine. I had never heard of this woman. And you know, it struck me that we know some degree that there were people who, there were presidents who had slaves, but we don't know who these slaves were. And so part of my research was basically just trying to get a handle on who these individuals were, uh, at least covering that particular period. Uh, one of the other people who was enslaved to Washington who escaped was his cook named Hercules. Uh, Hercules, by the 1790s was considered one of the best cooks in the country, top chef, right? And he was very well known, and Washington saw him as one of his most loyal uh, individuals who was, who was enslaved to him. And he was the only person that Washington would let go back and forth between Mount Vernon and uh, Pennsylvania. But at the end of Washington's presidency, they looked up one day and Hercules was gone. <laughs> And they never captured Hercules. They never figured out what happened to Hercules. But again, you know, you get these stories of individuals who appear to be kind of one thing, and then the reality of, you know, people do not want to be enslaved, even at the kind of top end or privileged end of it. This was their whole thing about Oni, was why would you escape? We give you food, we take care of you. And she was like, that is not it. You don't get it. You absolutely kind of don't get it. Right, so that was kind of what was going on in Washington's house in Pennsylvania. Uh, I would note that 
in, two, in 1999, when the National Park Service wanted to move the Liberty Bell to this brand new pavilion, this $150 million pavilion, the, as it turns out, the place where they were going to build the pavilion was right over the property where Washington had lived when he had been president, and particularly over the part of the house where the slaves were kept. So when historians and community activists found out about it, they demanded that in building this uh, new pavilion that there be some way of acknowledging what had happened on this site. Park Service resisted, it was a 10 year battle, Congress got involved, the mayor, finally the National Park Service relented and says, okay, we're tired, okay, fine, 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 we'll do something. So they opened this new pavilion at the end of December uh, 2010, and if you go now, there's a plaque that honors the, or acknowledges the people who were enslaved, uh, and it mentions their names. Uh, it mentions nine, in my research, I've actually found more than nine, but it mentions nine uh, individuals who were enslaved in Washington while he was president. Doesn't exist anywhere else. This is why this letter from Gary Ackerman and beginning a discussion about doing something like that at the White House uh, is important uh, to do. So this was all going on. Now, after, uh, after 10 years, after 1800, the White House or the president's moves back to uh, Washington, D.C. And then there are a number of key individuals that stand out there. Uh, one is Paul Jennings. Uh, there's a wonderful new book out by Beth Taylor uh, that I really recommend that everybody get a hold of that goes into, I give a little bit of attention uh, to Paul Jennings, but she has a whole book that details the critical role that he played uh, when he was with Madison. He was there at the White House when it was burnt down, when the British came during the, the war with the British, uh, 1814, and he was there packing up as the British were kind of basically down the road on horses looking towards the White House. Uh, he is important because he wrote the first uh, manuscript of someone who worked in the White House. And so we get some rich details about his relationship with, Madison, with uh, James Madison, his relationship with Dolly Madison. Turns out that Dolly Madison had kind of reneged on the deal that when, he, when James Madison died, Paul Jennings would be set free. Didn't happen. It took a while for him to earn some money and to work with Daniel Webster and finally kind of uh, get his freedom. Uh, but as things developed, Dolly Madison fell on really hard times. Her family friends kind of abandoned her. Paul Jennings would take her food, give her a little money. He was like, you know, you did me wrong, but you know, I understand the situation you're in, and I have a compassion for you, and I would do something. Now, what James uh, Paul Jennings doesn't talk about is his central role in the largest mass escape effort in Washington, D.C. for slaves, which took place in 1848. And it was a deal where basically people would get on a boat. Uh, this was on a Saturday night when slaves more or less could walk around free, and the boat would take off. And by the time it was realized the next day that everyone had gone, or large numbers had gone, they would have such a head start, they couldn't be caught. Uh, but as it turns out, they ran into bad weather, the boat had to pull aside, slowed them down, and then someone back in Washington, D.C. betrayed them and said, no, they didn't go on foot north, they were in the boat going south. So the posse got in a bigger boat, faster boat, and they ended up catching everybody. Paul was not on the boat, so he was never captured, and in fact, it wasn't until much, much, much later that it was even discovered that he played a central role uh, in that. But he's a key figure. And because he played a role in saving a very famous painting at the White House in 2010, Nine. 2009, uh, his family was invited to the White House, the descendants, uh, for commemorating uh, the saving of this painting and the role that Paul had played uh, in that. But again, these are stories that are generally kind of uh, unknown. Uh, there are a couple other people I'll talk about, and then we're kind of coming up on the time, and then I'll just open it up. Uh, one is Elizabeth Keckley. Uh, Elizabeth was uh, a seamstress businesswoman who had originally been in slavery, 
uh, in Missouri, but ended up finding her way to Washington, D.C. She really had a very fascinating kind of background in terms of uh, people that she ran into. But she came to Washington, D.C., and one of the first persons she met was Vanya Davis, the wife of Jefferson Davis. And she became her uh, dressmaker. Now, 1860, of course, the country was very tense. Everybody believed war was coming. And then when Lincoln was elected, the war was on. And members of Congress from the South began resigning because everybody was going back to start preparing for the war that everyone knew was coming. Vanya comes to Elizabeth and says, well, Elizabeth, uh, Jefferson is resigning. He's going back. He's going to be president of the Confederacy. You should come with us. And when we win the war, we're going to come back. And we'll be president of the United States, and you can come back with us then. Elizabeth says, no, that plan doesn't work for me. I don't see going to Mississippi to be down there while you guys are waging war as, as, a, as a plan. So she says, no, that's not going to happen. Uh, bye, Vanya. Uh, then as it turns out, within a very short period, she meets Mary Lincoln. And her and Mary Lincoln basically become best friends. And she's with Mary through all of the war. Uh, and when Lincoln is shot, the very first person that Mary Lincoln calls for is Elizabeth. Because Mary never fit into kind of the Washington crowd, and Elizabeth and her really kind of connected. Uh, as many of you know, the Lincolns lost a son while they were in the White House. Um, uh, Elizabeth was there for that. She helped to, like, bathe the child. She helped there for the funeral. And Elizabeth lost her son during the war, uh, who had joined the, uh, the military. He actually was passing for white, because he joined before uh, African Americans were permitted to be part of the war. But he, he wanted to fight, he joined, and he was killed in, in battle. So they had a lot to connect. But they became very best friends. But beyond her being the best friends with Mary Lincoln, she was also very active. And she organized for the thousands of people who had left plantations uh, to come to Washington, D.C. When Washington issued, uh, when Lincoln issued the Emancipa Emancipation Proclamation, uh, which didn't necessarily free slaves. It said those who are in areas that we don't control, you're free. And those who are areas we do control, you're not free. But when all people heard was emancipation, they didn't bother with the rest of it. So <laughs> people started pouring into Washington in the thousands, shirts on their back. Elizabeth said, this is not right. So she started organizing schools. She started organizing food, clothing for them. So she wasn't just uh, tight with Mary Washington, but she was also very, very active uh, in her own right. Remarkable individuals that kind of pop up. Uh, one other person I'll talk about uh, before I transition to the end uh, is James Benjamin Parker. And in 1901, when uh, President McKinley was at a state fair up in New York, and he's standing there, and there's Secret Service behind him, and the police is be behind him, and he's greeting people. And standing in line is an assassin. There's an anarchist who's there to kill the president. And he's standing there. He has a big white bandage around his hand where the gun is hidden. Probably was kind of obvious, and he probably looked a little bit crazy, <laughs> right? But apparently, the Secret Service and the police were focused on the black man who was standing behind him, who was a big, giant fellow. Uh, and they, for whatever reason, were kind of eyeing him. So the assassin steps up, fires off a shot, and the first shot bounces off a button. So McKinley's not injured. Secret Service and police are frozen. They don't do anything. So he fires a second shot, which hits. McKinley in the abdomen, in the stomach. They still don't do anything. So the black man standing behind him, James Benjamin Parker, takes the guy down, knocks him to the floor, kicks the gun away, giving him a beat down. So finally, the Secret Service and police grab the guy, you know, and then they drag him off, right? And James Benjamin Parker becomes a hero overnight. There are articles in the, Washington, in the Atlantic, uh, the Atlanta Journal, in the New York Times. There are poems about him because people like Booker T. Washington are saying, see, we told you. We would give our life 
for the president. We would give our life for this country. We are not a threat. And this was in 1901. This was the height of Jim Crow law. It was the height of lynchings. It was the height of racism uh, in the country at the time. So for an African-American to step forward and save the president was a remarkable kind of uh, occurrence. And he actually did save McKinley because McKinley didn't die from the injury. It was a serious injury, but medically it should have been dealt with. But he received terrible, terrible medical uh, treatment. He ended up getting an infection from the treatment, uh, and then he died uh, later. So this is 1901. Um, on October 16th, 1901, uh, several weeks later, now Th Theodore Roosevelt is the president. He invites Booker T. Washington to dinner at the White House. And this is the very famous dinner that upset the South. John McCain talked about this in his concession speech uh, on election night back in 2008, how that particular incident had resonated so profoundly. The fact that uh, African-American was having dinner at the White House and reportedly with Roosevelt's daughter and wife. And so that, the cause, you see the literature in the editorials, people were calling for burning down the White House, they were calling for impeachment, I mean, they completely went ballistic, to the point where no other African-American was invited to eat at the White House for nearly 30 years, not until 1928, right? So this was October 16th, 1901. The very next day, October 17th, 1901, is when uh, Theodore Roosevelt officially named the White House, the White House. Because prior to that, it had been called the President's House, the Executive Mansion, they had all kinds of informal names. There were a lot of journalists who were starting to call it the White House, but it never had that official title. Now, the one incident didn't cause the other, but the conjuncture of the two is very notable because in the South, you saw editorials and letters saying white was a racial term, not just how the building looked. And so it was interpreted on multiple levels, but also in these very racialized uh, kinds of terms. So there are lots and lots of these stories that we didn't know. All of us grew up learning American history, learning history of the presidents, we never got that side of the story, the kind of from below up side of it. And so that's much of what I was trying to do in the book. Now, there was a broader context that I was trying to, to, to do as well that uh, even I often don't speak about, which is the question of the expectations from Obama, particularly vis-a-vis -vis the black community, but other communities around the issues of race in the US. And there was a high degree of um, uh, expectation that perhaps Obama could start to address some of these disparities that have existed for decades in health, in education, in employment, in environmental impact, in criminal justice, a whole range of areas. Uh, and what I wanted to do was look at what has happened historically that was the basis on which we made advancements around these issues. And my conclusion was that these things happen, we have advancements when we have crisis. Because crisis opens up the space to do things that you normally cannot do. So the Civil War, the Great Depression, the 1960s. If we look at Lincoln, we look at Franklin Roosevelt, we look at Lyndon Johnson, they were operating in situations where the space opened up for them to do the kinds of progress and to propose and support the kind of legislation that they could not do normally. Lincoln, for example, because of the demands of the war, opened up not only to uh, bring African Americans into the war, but also began to meet with African Americans. The very first meeting between African American political leaders and a president happened under Lincoln. We saw the same thing during the Roosevelt presidency, mostly with Eleanor Roosevelt, but she also opened up space because of the challenges of the time. And then under uh, Lyndon Johnson, we saw the same thing. So the question is, will Obama have the kind of crisis or the kind of space where he can actually address some of these issues doesn't seem likely. Uh, we will see if he gets a second term, 
where he's no longer like most first-term presidents worried about a second term, if that creates space. But the thing about second-term presidents is that they're lame duck presidents. So there's not a lot of, often not a lot, particularly in the last couple of years, of feeling that we owe the president anything because he's not going to be around anymore. So we're, we're still kind of in a transition uh, to witness sort of what's going to be the legacy of President Obama on some of these issues. Uh, but I think there's still a lot um, that can unfold. So let me end it there and open it up. Thank you very much for your attention. And let's go forward. <laughs> Thank you very much, Professor Hussein. And uh, so much of, although historical, so much of what you had to say uh, seems so relevant to today. I somehow missed the story of McKinley in, in, in your book, but I, I found that in some ways the most surprising and remarkable, I think, about uh, racial profiling today and yeah. the term driving while black. Who knew that watching a president while black was also yeah. a form of right. racial profiling back in those days? My question for you is, given the incredible paradox or hypocrisy that your entire book underscores, uh, were there any outside the White House itself, be they activists, be they politicians, be they simply religious figures committed to a cause, who used the story of African Americans in the White House to underscore the hypocrisy. I understand that this is something that is not part of the mainstream history, but were there not people who really sh shown a spotlight on this story, just the way, just the way your book does? Yep, the, the White House as kind of a symbol became fodder for many people who were activists. For example, and I think it's probably unknown even among a lot of uh, uh, people who write about black history, there was an effort to create a black house in Washington, D.C. And this was led by the people who were associated with the Marcus Garvey movement. In the end of the teens, I think in like 1919, uh, there was a very famous gathering of Marcus Garvey's organization, uh, Universal Negro Improvement Association, and they elected a black president, they elected a black vice president, and then they also voted to create a black house in Washington, D.C. that would be an alternative to the White House. It would be the vehicle through which they would be able to uh, articulate the grievances of not only the black community in the U.S., but black community around the world. Now, it never really happened. It was more kind of a pipe dream than it was uh, a reality. But the White House has had that kind of uh, um, uh, symbolism. Now, the White House itself in Washington, D.C., in the last 20 years or so of the 19th century, was one of the few places in the country and one of the few places in Washington, D.C. that was integrated. And the picture from the book is taken from the Easter egg hunt, the Easter egg hunt uh, in 1898, I believe. And it was taken by a very famous photographer. But on that particular day, the gates were open. And what had, was an absolute non-starter outside of those gates, black children and white children uh, could come together. And they could play. And this was critical. The Easter egg, Easter egg hunt had originally started on Capitol Hill, but Congress members started complaining about the kids tearing up the grass and everything. So they moved it to uh, the White House. And it became space for people to uh, begin to have these kinds of pictures. The White House also, uh, back in the day, would open up on January 1st for people to come in and greet the president. And if you were in Washington, D.C., you just lined up at the gate, and you walked in, and you got to shake hands with the president and kind of wander around uh, the White House for a bit. Now, this was non-racial. And there were as many black people as many white people uh, came. Uh, there's an interesting story relative to the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, Lincoln originally wrote it in the summer of 1862, but he was not planning to sign it until January 1st, 1863. 
And so that particular day, January 1st, Lincoln had been greeting people the entire day. And in the evening when it came time for him to sign it, his hand was shaking because it was just, you know, there's been so much squeezing and pressure on it. So he was about to sign it, his hand was shaking, and he stopped. And he said, you know, no, I'm not going to sign this because when future generations look at this document, I don't want them to see any shakiness at all. There is no doubt that this needs to happen. And so he waited till his hand calmed down, and then he signed the document. Right. But the White House has been, you know, part of the uh, arguments over the years about its symbolism. There have been calls, for example, going back at least to the 1950s to change the name. And there have been petitions. People tried to get Congress members. No Congress member ever took it up. But there have been efforts to do that. And even now, you will hear this if you listen carefully. Michelle Obama often refers to it as the people's house. Right? And she's gotten a little bit of flack from Fox on that. <laughs> but you know, she, she very much you know, recognizes, you know, and she would never say, you know, it shouldn't be called the White House for, for these kinds of reasons. But she also try, you know, she tries, and she hasn't been the only one, you know, to spin it a little bit to say that, you know, it really is not just where the president lives, but this is really a symbolism of the country. And if we can open up the space for uh, it to be seen in a broader kind of way, then that's that's a good thing. Professor Lusane, thank you so much. It was a great talk. Um, so here at UVA, obviously, we study Jefferson a lot, and so that means a lot of our uh, a lot of our learning centers around Sally Hemings and that story. And I feel like, I believe that that story has kind of made its way into the popular discourse when people discuss Jefferson's legacy. Um, but listening to some of your stories, it sounds like that hasn't been the same for many of the other founding fathers. And I was wondering what you thought the role of these stories, uh, now that you bring them to light and trying to make them more well known, what role they should have when people discuss some of the legacies of the founding fathers? Do you think that they will have an impact on how we look back on uh, these, would you say, 12 presidents who had slaves in, in that generation? Well, that's a good question. The, uh, one of my goals is to just broaden the discussion, is not to attack the presidents. It's not to say you know, these were inherently evil people who lived nothing but contradictions, but that these were complex people, and complex in complex times. And they were not all the same. There were some presidents who were anti-slavery who had slaves. There were some presidents who were pro-slavery who had slaves, like Jackson, for example, who was completely unapologetic. And then you end up with people who were anti-slavery leaning towards abolition. You know, so there were different categories of even these presidents uh, who owned slaves. Part of what has happened, though, is in our rendering of these histories, we drop out all of these nuances and all these complexities and see them either as kind of these perfect apostles of democracy, and these things are sort of kind of in the closet, or we embed them with the kind of uh, evilness that we would give to the worst slave holder uh, in the country, and that's just not the case. So it really is, and, you know, and all of us who are teachers know that we want our students to not have easy answers. We want people to see things in, as complicated uh, and as real a way uh, as possible. So that's really what I was trying to do. And hopefully these stories will uh, open up the space. As I say, there's lots and lots of research areas uh, that I think are still available to do. Uh, and again, uh, Beth's book you know, is one of these that takes a slice of this and really kind of goes into detail, really gives it kind of context. And it gives us a richer sense of James Madison, of the White House, of that particular period. So that's what I, you know, my, my goal and objective was uh, in trying to uh, uncover uh, these stories. We have a, a question from Facebook from David Remington in Washington, D.C. And the question is, what have you found is the least known aspect of the black history of the White House? And does it vary by generation? Uh, it does. Uh, I think there is kind of a sense of, there's a hidden sense of how the White House actually functions. And the White House is an institution with a large household staff. And uh, being in Washington, D.C. area, 
Uh, a lot of what I've gotten since the book has come out have been people coming up to me wanting to know why their relatives weren't in the book. <laughs> you, know, my, you know, my uncle used to cut hair at the White House. You know, my grandmother worked upstairs. Why isn't she in the book? And so, you know, what it reveals is that people don't know this history outside of Washington, D.C., to a great degree inside of Washington, D.C., uh, and that really needs to be, be told. Uh, last weekend, in fact, I was in Ontario, California. There's a museum there called the Museum of History and Art, and they have the traveling exhibit of Working White House. It's called the Working White House, and it's an exhibit that demonstrates not just black workers, but people who work in the White House, people who do the cooking, people who do the cleaning, you know, all those kinds of different tasks. And that is, there's always been a black presence there from the very first day that the door opened all the way up to now, some of it generational, that people have passed on from fathers, daughters, mothers, sisters, you know, kind of all have been uh, engaged. And that has been unknown. At a certain point in 1950s, you begin to get people on the president's uh, executive staff, uh, beginning with uh, E. Frederick Morrow, and then following with people from Condoleezza Rice to Colin Powell and others. But there's always been that long, long history of participation, engagement uh, with the White House uh, by the black community. And that story just has not been uh, told. Well, from all those relatives, it sounds like advanced sales for volume two could be uh, <laughs> really brisk. <laughs> Professor Lee saying, thank you for coming. I found your talk intriguing. Um, so you spoke a lot about commemoration, which, as you may or may not know, is actually a fairly salient issue here at the University of Virginia. Um, obviously, Thomas Jefferson was one of those presidents who owned slaves, and the University of Virginia was also uh, largely built by slave labor. Um, most recently, you know, in the past couple of years, we, there have been several slave burial sites that have been discovered at UVA, and commemoration has been a big part of how the university has addressed that issue. Um, my question to you is then, what role does commemoration play in developing that public history um, that, you're, that you're trying to uncover here? Uh, and how far can that go uh, in helping people recognize those figures that haven't been recognized enough? Thank you. Ex uh, excellent question. Uh, commemoration, I think, is exceedingly uh, important because memory is important. And how we remember things how we publicly remember things really sets a lot of the tone for how the country thinks of itself and how the country presents itself. And when we, the reason we put up these statues, the reason we put up plaques, the reason we have people sitting on horses is because it's part of the collective memory that we want to honor and we want to not forget because when we forget, then all kinds of other stories start to come in. You begin to think about, well, the Civil, right, the Civil War was not about slavery. It was about some other things that were going on. But that's because we have not, in part, refreshed our memory in a way in which we understand what the Civil War really kind of was about. And the same with the history, I think, of Washington and Jefferson uh, and these other individuals, is that it gives us a fuller, more complete, and more satisfying understanding of, of who we are. And in that sense, memory. There's a, you know, a lot of studies about uh, public and collective memory being really essential for countries to move forward. When we've had uh, conflict areas uh, and those conflicts have had to come to an end, almost invariably there are going to be plaques or there are going to be statues or there's going to be a closure that takes that particular situation to the next level. And so having these commemorations is critical. This is again why, you know, my, and I talked to people at the White House Historical Association about doing something to commemorate uh, and to acknowledge what happened in the White House. And now with this letter from uh, Congressman uh, Ackerman, uh, there may be more space opening up uh, to make that happen. But that becomes a moment of, uh, community consolidation rather than, I think, community division to reach that kind of collective sense of now we can get past this, now we have closed the door and we have marked this. That's why the Martin Luther King Memorial was, again, so important. 
Thank you for your captivating talk. It was really great. I was talking this week to a friend of mine in Baltimore City, and we were talking about a lot of racial issues and things. And your closing comments about your statements uh, about President Obama really just perked my ears because she said so many of the blacks here in Baltimore City think Obama is our president and she said but he's not he's the president of all the people and there are too many problems and they've got to get a life and get straightened out on this and what percentage of the population of the black population do you think really feel that he's their president and really don't think that he's everybody's president Oh, about 100%. <laughs> no, I, I think it's uh, the, you know, the one, uh, one of the things I'm working on right now is looking at the impact of the Obama election on discourses and practices around race around the world. Because it was really kind of a global impact of the a rising and then ultimate success of uh, President Obama. And, you know, I think we haven't given that that much attention that what he signified for people here, but also for people around the world who felt marginalized, was that this was a significant step. It wasn't a revolution, it wasn't resolving all the problems, but it was a breakthrough that people could not have imagined 10 years ago absolutely not 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Now, you have people like Martin Luther King who gave an uh, interview in 1968 where he said he thought there could be a black president in 40 years. He was off by four years. But most people, if you had asked them in 1968 or 78 or 98, for a whole lot of people in 2008, <laughs> they would not have thought this was possible at all. And so the resonance of having Obama uh, really kind of dug deep. He won like 95% of the black vote, which meant he didn't just win Democratic voters. He didn't just win independent voters. He won Republican black voters. Colin Powell, Condoleezza Rice, they may never say it, but I absolutely think that that's who they voted for. Because the meaning of having this uh, person now, at the same time, I think there is a broad sense in the black community that he is president of the entire country. And if you read the debates that go on, like in the black newspapers and on black websites, uh, a lot of the discussion about what Obama has done, hasn't done, uh, focuses on that particular bit debate. But there are a lot of people who argue he is the president of the entire country. Now, black people are part of the country, so he should be addressing issues related to concerns of different communities. But he can't just address issues affecting black community. So I think there's a sense of, uh, you know, that he has a broad mandate uh, to bring change to the country. And, you know, the judgment on that is, you know, still kind of working itself out. But there's certainly, I think, a broad sense that he's both the president of the black community, but he's also the president of the whole country. So, but that's a good question. I mean, it's, and it's a, a very tricky kind of balance there, but people kind of roll with it, I think. Uh, thank you very much. And my uh, question regarding the person who died, the black person who, was, who looked white, and that was the only reason he could uh, get into the army. Um, could you talk more about how the blacks were, uh, in general, were excluded from the army and for what reason? Okay. Uh, well, during, when uh, the Civil War began, of course, most uh, African Americans were uh, still enslaved in the South. And the free blacks who existed were barred from the military. Lincoln was a very reluctant uh, commander in chief. And he thought he could negotiate his way out the war. He thought, you know, in a number of different ways, it actually would have been better for the South if they had actually surrendered in the first year. <laughs> because as the war went on, Lincoln began to change. Lincoln began to meet with Frederick Douglass. 
He began to meet with Sojourner Truth. He began to meet with a whole range of other uh, black leaders and black voices. He had discussions with Elizabeth Keckley, and he began to move and realize that abolition was the only way, not only to end this war, but to take the country to the next step. And that would open up a whole range of opportunities, including the military. Uh, his first meeting with Frederick Douglass, Lincoln, Frederick Douglass came with an agenda, and one of those items was that there are free African Americans who want to join the war. They are committed to fighting this and ending slavery. Lincoln said, no, it's too provocative. We might still can work this out. By his second meeting with Lincoln, uh, with um, Douglas, and particularly since the war wasn't going all that great for the Union, Lincoln was like, yeah, you're right. We need to open this up. And they opened up the space. And that's when we begin to see African Americans having opportunities to be uh, part of the military. But Lincoln evolved to that decision. It wasn't kind of there automatically. But those engagements, those discussions, those uh, back and forths uh, put, took Lincoln to a very different place. The Lincoln of 1865 was really different than the Lincoln of 1860. But that was a you know, very torturous process uh, in many ways. But you know, part of the reason Lincoln was assassinated was because he was advocating for voting rights for black people who had been freed, black men uh, who had been freed. And the last speech he gave where he talked about that, John Wilkes Booth was sitting there listening, and he was like, he will die, he will die, he will die, because that is just the last straw. So again, you know, Lincoln gets to a particular place, but it's, you know, it's, it's a big move for him uh, to make that happen. I think we can assume that the first child born in the White House was not a family member of a president, but in all likelihood a uh, child of a slave. Yes, that's um, exactly right. Is there any documentation on that, or could you speculate on when that occurrence might have been? Uh, yeah, it was like 1902. Uh, and there actually is detail about the two uh, individuals, the parents as well as the child. Uh, I just don't have it at the top of my head, but you're absolutely right. The first child born in the White House was born to uh, people who were enslaved. So again, you know, there's this just rich, rich, unknown history uh, that we uh, can tap, you know, we can tap into. And again, you know, you know, I tried to get it in about 500 pages and couldn't. You know, so there's lots of research uh, still to be done. There's lots of openings for uh, all these different periods of history. Uh, for for those of you who both, you know, as professors and as students, you know, who were concerned and interested in these areas, there's just a rich pool of things now uh, that we should be looking at, or can you know that that are there for us. Hi, um, I just want to say thank you for bringing this situation to the forefront. But um, you know, in elementary school, as you learn social uh, social studies and all. Um, you kind of learn slavery from a different context from the forefathers, and they're never really integrated. Um, you never really learn about George Washington having slaves um, when you're eight or nine years old, when they start incorporating slavery into the curriculum. And I was just wondering, do you ever think it will get to a point where they will start to do that for young kids, or is that too much for them? Like, is that too heavy a subject for them to understand that um, the people who started our country in a way were also partaking in this, yeah. No, um, um, no very uh, insightful question. Uh, it's actually really uneven around the country. There are many places where the broad history of presidents owning slaves is included in the curriculum. If you go like to some of the black independent schools or some of the schools that are more kind of liberal and radical, uh, that exists. For most of the public schools, that history is not there. I've been working with uh, Teachers for Change, which is an organization that develops curriculums around particular issues. And we've developed a curriculum around this particular history of uh, presidents and slavery. But we're also fighting another trend, which is to actually eliminate these kinds of studies. If we look at what's happening in Arizona, for example, 
where they just gotten rid of uh, Latino studies. And there are proposals all over the country in Oklahoma, in Alabama, in Mississippi, in Florida to get rid of these alternative studies, Native American studies, black studies, uh, in some cases, uh, global studies. Because there's a kind of argument that we don't need to know that much about the world other than control it. <laughs> and so you've got you know, some really alternative perspectives on you know, what should be the um, uh, elements of education. So it, it, it's a challenge. It, it really is a challenge. But I, I do think you know, with us putting out and trying to do research and, and publishing, at least we create the foundation on which uh, schools and educators can, you know, can have some material that they can use. But it really is a challenge at this point. Well, uh, Professor Hussein, uh, with that last question, I think you got a suggestion for volume three, <laughs> which is really terrific because it gives us two more opportunities to invite you back to the Miller Center. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Brian. Thank you.